thousands of people have mysteriously vanished in America's wilderness. Join us as we dive into the deep end of the unexplainable and try to piece together what happened. You are listening to Locations Unknown. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Locations Unknown. I'm your co-host, Joe Irado, and with me, as always, is a man who can dice onions without shedding a tear, Mike (laughs) Vandebogard. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Don't have a lot of new updates for our listeners. I would like to give a couple of shout-outs, though, for this episode. Uh, First, once again, uh, we've got several new Patreon supporters I'd like to uh, shout-out. Jamie... Oh, and by the way, uh, as always, Joe, I apologize for my pronunciation of the names (laughs) (laughs) so uh we've got jamie chapel uh aaron fitzpatrick uh this one i'm gonna dice dice up uh move fulio okunde i'm very sorry for that individual for i'm sure i did not say that right uh hope mufulio okunde okunde uh yeah okunade i bet it's akunade i don't know the first part um, Hope Razier, Brandy Sanchez, Nina Seraf- Seraphim, and Anna Pesnell. So we're like the most Midwest guys ever. <laughs> it's like we haven't left the Midwest, and we're pretty well traveled. But yeah, I, I can't get these names either sometimes. So I'm with Mike. I apologize also on, on his behalf and my own. Yeah. So thank you though for helping to support the show. Right after this episode, Joe and I will be recording another Patreon-only episode. And you can get access to those extra episodes for just a dollar a month. So if you really like our show and you can't get enough of us, uh, we've got some more content over at Patreon and we'll be adding to that every month. I would also like to thank uh, our listener Megan Gross for sending us this case idea. We get a lot of interesting emails and messages every month and... Some of them are, they're all really interesting cases, but some of them just don't kind of fit with what we do for the show. But this case, after I read through it, seemed uh, very interesting and a lot of kind of mystery to it. So thank you again to uh, Megan Gross for sending us this case idea. Yeah, and don't feel bad if we don't choose your case, because we do have uh, a list of cases we are going through, and sometimes they'll suggest it, and it was one that's already on our docket. So it has nothing to do with if the case is good or not, or we didn't like your suggestion. It's just along the lines of us pre-planning out the year and seeing what type of cases we're going to be doing. Yeah, so thank you again to all our new Patreon supporters and to Megan for recommending this episode. I don't have any other updates, Joe. Well, all right, everybody. Let's gear up and get out to explore locations unknown. On June 14th, 2020, Erica Lloyd decided to set off on a pandemic road trip to Joshua Tree National Park, where she planned to camp and hike. After she failed to check in with family for several days, she was declared missing on June 17th. Adding to the mystery, her vandalized car was found a day earlier by law enforcement on a highway near the park. Over the next several months, Friends, family, and law enforcement continued searching for Erica, but with no luck. Strangely, during this search, a shocking discovery was made relating to another missing persons case in the area. What happened to Erica and her car? Are the two cases related to each other? Join us this week as we try to piece together what happened to Erica Lloyd. Joshua Tree National Park is part of Riverside and San Bernardino County, California. 
This is in the southern portion of California and was originally declared a national monument in 1936. Joshua Tree was redesignated as a national park in 1994 when the U.S. Congress passed the California Desert Protection Act. Nine established campgrounds exist in the park. Two have water and flush toilets and can be reserved. Others are first come, first served by patrons. Backcountry camping here is permitted with very few regulations. Now, as far as hiking goes, there are several hiking trails within the park, many of which can be accessible from a campground or a road. Shorter trails, such as the one-mile hike through Hidden Valley, offer a chance to view the beauty of the park without straying too far into the desert. And, Mike, we've covered Joshua Tree three times so far. I can't remember. I, th- I, think the- it's, I think it's three times, and I think in all three times it made it very clear how important it is not to stray into the desert because it's hot yes. there. And that's where they run into a lot of issues. So for a park with short trails that are well designated, there are people that die, go missing, and have some issues there. So it is it is one of the more dangerous parks I think we've covered based on just the stories we've heard. Yes. So there is a section of the California Riding and Hiking Trail that meanders for about 35 miles or 56 kilometers through the western side of the park. So the types of things you'd want to bring when hiking, water, food, layers of clothing, sun protection, first aid kit, sturdy shoes, a map and a compass, pocket knife or multi-tool, flashlight, headlamp, and then an emergency shelter or blanket in case you end up getting stuck out there and have to survive the night. And um, I do want to specify too, because I think a lot of people think desert, hot, short sleeves, and shorts. It is very important that I mean, I, I mean, I'm not going to tell people what to wear, but I always wear pants and long sleeves or have them available in high heat desert. Yeah, it's interesting. I always wondered growing up why cowboys like in movies and TV shows wore long shirts and pants, you know, out in the desert. And after doing desert hiking, I, I understand why, because during the day it helps you not get sunburned and at night it keeps you warm. <laughs> yeah, you'll the sun if anyone if anyone's gone to the beach and knows how draining the sun can be. Yeah. Now now add on miles of hiking and dehydration to that. You want to actually cover your skin. It's going to help a lot more than uh, simply just wearing sunscreen and, and walking out into the sunlight, especially in the desert. So, just just a little tidbit. Yeah, and this list is kind of pretty generic. I, this is all stuff you probably want to bring on every hike you go on out in the yeah. country. Um, but. I, I know we do get comments from people about how they do like hearing the aspect of kind of how to operate in the backcountry safely. So I think it's very important, even if, even if you're just doing a day hike, that you have these items with you in case something happens where you're stuck out there for, you know, overnight or hopefully absolutely you know, not longer than that. Yeah, I think it, get lo- it gets lost on us sometimes for the things that we take. Um, because we've been doing it so long, we don't think about there's, there's the general tools, but there are people that don't hike or backpack that might not know to bring some of those things. So yeah, it, it's pretty, it's pretty good stuff. So amount of visitors per year, Joshua tree sees almost 3 million visitors. Uh, well, at least in 2019, obviously this last year, I think all the numbers are going to be down significantly for obvious reasons. Yep. Um, so just over 4 million people live in the area. So they see, about a million people shy of, of how many people live in the area as visitors from other places. So it is a very popular park. Uh, just a couple interesting facts about the area. Uh, from the 1860s through the 1940s, miners worked roughly 300 pit mines. The most successful was the Lost Horse Mine, which produced gold and silver worth about $5 million in today's currency. Mormon pioneers were more impressed by the trees They thought the limbs of the Joshua tree resembled the upstretched arms of Joshua leading them to the promised land, and the tree's name is thought to have come from them. Early explorer John Fremont described Joshua tree as the most repulsive tree (laughs) in the vegetable kingdom. (laughs) That's hilarious, because I could totally see both sides. Like, you have the Mormons who are looking at it from, like, a holy aspect and seeing how beautiful it was, and John Fremont's like, this is disgusting. (laughs) It's all in the eye of the beholder, I guess. It is. So, more than 550,000 acres of Joshua Tree National Park, parks nearly 800,000 acres, are designated as wilderness. So a lot of it is just open, sprawling desert. So an in-depth description of the features. Um, As we said, it's nearly 800,000 acres. The exact size is 790,636 acres, and that is an area slightly larger 
than the state of Rhode Island to give you an idea of how big this park is. The climate is desert climate consisting of two deserts whose ecosystems are determined by elevation. So you have the higher Mojave Desert and the lower Colorado Desert. The Mojave Desert is an arid rain shadow desert that is the driest desert in North America. Its boundaries are generally noted by the presence of Joshua trees. So if you're not familiar with what a rain shadow is, it's the because of the way the Rocky Mountains work, when rain clouds that would normally come over and rain on this area, they basically get pushed up and they rain on the eastern side of the Rockies, which leaves the western side of the Rockies completely dry, and then it becomes the desert. So the park's oldest rocks are roughly 1.7 billion years old. The highest point is Quail Mountain at 5,183 feet. The lowest point is down to just 934 feet uh, at Pinto Wells. Now the types of danger that are present in regards to animals, they have 19 different types of lizards, uh, 26 different species of snakes, some of them that are venomous, a giant hairy scorpion, which has a sting that's similar to a wasp sting. Sounds terrifying. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. I've I've been bitten. I've been stung by a scorpion that's small. I don't want to. Well, I, you know what? The small ones are usually poisonous. I got lucky. I didn't get bit by a poisonous one. But the larger they are, they say the safer they are as far as venom goes. Which I don't want to be around any of them. No. <laughs> uh, they do have tarantulas. Uh, they're shy. They're noted as shy, but the bite is no worse than a bee sting. Also. They do have desert bighorn sheep that can be somewhat aggressive. I'm sure you've seen videos of them ramming each other. They do have black bears, kangaroo rats, coyotes, foxes. Uh, they do have bobcats and mountain lions. There is a Mojave Desert tortoise that I'm sure you do not have to be worried about. No. <laughs> and just other basic animals like squirrels and birds that are in the area. So of all the things, even with the animals included, as far as the dangers, I think exposure is the worst one. Would you not agree? I, I would absolutely agree. I think, you know, maybe I've we've almost been bit bitten by snakes on trails. But oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But definitely exposure, especially depending on what time of the year you're hiking, uh, you know, heat and sun exposure will be, um, you know, pretty significant in the summer months. Yeah, they say the park recommends you bring two gallons of water when hiking or climbing. So that's just an example of you have to be, you know, bringing one water bottle in your flip-flops and shorts uh, with a sun hat is not going to cut it when you're actually going to be doing a hike there. No, and that's, you know, they recommend two gallons. I I would recommend potentially even more. I mean, everybody knows themselves, but, um, you know, if you're you're doing some strenuous hikes, you're going to go through more than two gallons of water if it's really hot and dry out. So, yeah, um, it, it it's it never hurts to bring more water than you need because you yep. can always drink it away. Yeah. So outside of the exposure, there's limited cell service in the park. We've learned that also from some of the other um, uh, cases we've covered. And there's always a flash flood potential in the desert. And for those that are not familiar, flash flood is because it's so dry and there isn't any roots. If it rains hard enough, instead of absorbing that water into the earth, it just starts flowing across the top. And when you have you know millions of gallons of water starting to move, you can sweep away cars, people. There's been significant death associated with just flash floods. And then last but not least of all those mines, there are old mine shafts. And curious people can go into them, fall, get hurt, and get stuck in them. So you want to avoid those types of things. So that, that gives a, a, a pretty high-level overview of Joshua Tree, some of the dangers, the, the, the environmental aspects of the desert. Now we're going to jump in to learn a little bit about Erica Lloyd. Erica Lloyd is 37 at the time of her disappearance. Her height is 5'4", around 125 pounds, dark brown hair, blue eyes. And the clothing she was last seen in was unknown, but she had camping clothing, and that's in quotes because... They just factored it off of she was going to go on this trip. Mm -hmm. uh, so she was she was in pretty good shape. You know, she didn't have any medical issues that we are aware of at this point. Um, but because of the, the pandemic, they say her personality has taken a toll. She accumulated a lot of her stress in 2020 because of unemployment, homeschooling her son, the protests, violence in the streets. Um, and this is according to a friend of hers who stopped over to see her on June 10th. Some, she, and she was quoted as saying, something seemed off. So I was like, the, this is a wellness check. 
and this is her friend Malone. Mm-hmm. Um, did I say her name right? Yeah, Rebecca Malone. Yeah. So she continues, we sat with a glass of wine, commiserating like, wow, these are crazy times. When Malone phoned four days later, Lloyd said she needed a mental health break. She told me, I'm going to be fine, says Malone. This is the last time I spoke to her. So, uh, you know, Joe, when I was researching this, I, so Rebecca, or Erica was a salon owner from what I gathered, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a successful salon. And I was on her Facebook page and her Instagram accounts kind of looking at her, you know, prior to the pandemic. And she seemed like a pretty successful businesswoman. And it, it really, I really got the sense that over the first, you know, six months of this pandemic, it really kind of started to grind her down to the point where, sure. I don't know if you want to call it a, a mental breakdown or, you know, whatever you want to call it. She was just, you know, she got COVID fatigue and just like, I, I got to go on a, um, you know, a pandemic road trip. So that was my impression of her. I can see that being a small business owner is not easy. It's, it's draining as it is. Um, is was she a single mother? It seemed like. Yeah, I believe she's a single so, mother. Yeah, one yeah, you, son. You have somebody who's working their butt off to to support their their child, uh, business owner, and then this happens, and she's forced to shut down her only means of you know providing for her family, probably relying on unemployment, those types of things. Yep. So we don't have to get into that, but you could imagine the mental toll that takes on somebody, even if they don't have a breakdown, but just slowly declining into depression potentially and. If anything, I'd say it was good that she realized that she needed something. Um, I won't get into if it was a responsible decision or not. We'll learn more about the timeline. But she's at least aware that it's it's affecting her and she needs to do something to try and and make it all better. That's kind of my initial take so far. I think, uh, you know, everybody is, you know, getting pandemic fatigue at this point. And some of us, you know, handle it better than others. And, uh, yeah, it's it's just sad to see this kind of stuff happen to individuals. But I think, um, you know, I, I think before the pandemic, I, you know, successful businesswoman, I think it, it did take its toll on her. Yeah, I agree. All right. Well with that, let's, let's get in the timeline. And then this is one that Mike covered. So I stayed away from too many, uh, points in the case just so I could come in with fresh eyes like you, the listener, and hopefully ask some good questions. Yeah. So this, case timeline really kind of starts off on June 14th. And I will just uh, make a note that I noticed this when I was reading through a lot of the news articles. And then actually, just earlier today, before we were going to record this, I was chatting with her mom uh, through Facebook. And she mentioned this too, that a lot of the early news reports kind of had information wrong about this case. So I I pulled some information from a lot of different news sources. So hopefully I've got the correct timeline in here. But if if we do get something wrong, we'll definitely make note of it and mention it on our next episode. Uh, So, like I said, the the case timeline really starts around June 14th. Uh, Erica was at home in her apartment in Walnut Creek. She told her roommates that she was planning to meet some people in Joshua Tree National Park. And this would be the last time her roommates would see uh, Erica. And according to the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department, they also uh, mentioned that the Sheriff's Department was never able to confirm who she was going to see in the park. So we still, uh, to this day, don't know what people she was going to see. Mm -hmm. So that's a little interesting. So that, that does make you think that maybe there are other people involved in what happened that are not you know, speaking out yet. Sure. So now it's June 15th and Erica's parents, uh, Ruth and Wayne, uh, reported saying that this was the last day they had talked to her, their daughter. And this was when she texted her son saying, uh, mommy, sorry for scaring you. I'll be back soon. So I don't, there wasn't a lot of context with that text. All I can assume is that maybe she kind of left in a hurry to go on this road trip to Joshua tree and, and didn't tell her son where she was going or I I don't know. Uh, so the articles I read didn't, you know, specify what the context of that text was. So did she, she dropped her son off with her parents and just left and didn't even tell her parents where she was going. Um, I, I do believe she dropped her son off with her parents, but I don't know specifically if she told them 
uh, where she she was going. I want to believe that maybe she did, but I do not know for sure. Okay. Uh, so it is now June 16th, 2020. So that's a Tuesday. So at some point during the day on Tuesday, the California Highway Patrol finds Erica's abandoned car near Highway 62 uh, near 29 Palms. Now, mind you, this is a day before she is actually reported missing. So uh, it, kind of a strange occurrence that they're finding her car abandoned and she's not yet missing. So when the California Highway Patrol pulled up, they noticed that her the car's windshield was shattered. And according to Bailey's Auto Repair and Towing, uh, there was a destroyed radio and a deployed airbag found inside. Uh, there was also a lot of uh, severe bumper damage to the driver's side and the front. The uh, David Bailey, who I believe owns the auto repair shop, also mentioned that the radiator and uh, air conditioned condenser were all smashed back, to which he suggested that she may have hit something. Um, he said that uh, he thought she might have hit a berm on the road when they grade the berms of the um, – that part of the road, they, it's kind of like a big mound of dirt. And she, he said people do hit that. So that's one possibility that she, she maybe uh, was driving at night and hit that. But so the car, and we'll post a picture of the car online, but it, it's pretty messed up. A lot of vandalism. Like more messed up, like more messed up than just simply hitting a berm, you think? Yeah. I, there's no reason why the windshield and the back window would be smashed out. So that, that's, uh, interesting though uh, strangely the uh, law enforcement officers uh, indicated that there was uh, no foul play involved or no indication of foul play in the car which I do kind of find a little strange that you have this car that's all smashed up and it has you know clearly been vandalized too but no foul play <laughs> so yeah, that's very interesting now uh, before we move on from the car I do want to mention that there were a lot of conflicting reports on the sighting of her car. There, there were several news articles that did report park rangers uh, found her car vandalized at the Indian Cove campground on Monday, June 15th. So this would be two full days before she was reported missing. So uh, according to these news sources, the rangers had left a note on the car noting the damage but when they checked back Monday night, the car was gone. So, and then some other news reports uh, reported that the car was actually seen near campsites 47 and 48 while patrolling the Jumbo Rock campground. So there are some several different news reports. I believe the California Highway Patrol, that one's true, obviously. And I, I do feel pretty confident that the Indian Cove campground sighting was also true because park rangers found it. So now you have an, int you know, you have a case where the car was vandalized and then somebody moved it Monday night and then abandoned it uh, Tuesday on the highway outside of the park. So it just makes you wonder what's going on. Yeah, that, that's super interesting. So I, during my research, I did find a quote from um, this individual who uh, now, I'll preface this. This was from Reddit, so I usually don't like pulling things from Reddit because you can't verify that it's uh, true or not. But this person claims to have been stationed as a ranger near the 29 Palms uh, area at this time. And this was the quote that he wrote. He says, I was stationed in 29 Palms close to where the car was found by CHP. The one entrance to Joshua Tree National Park is a few miles maybe two miles north of the car being found noting that it originally noting that it was originally found on the park grounds first with the damage to the vehicle. It does seem really suspicious. The area is brutal, albeit beautiful, but brutal. Nonetheless. Also, there's a lot of drug crime in the area, a single woman attractive and by herself in an area like this is never a good thing. And then he ends with, I wish her family, my sympathies. So, uh, I've never been the Joshua Tree. I don't think you have either, Joe. Um, or have not. It sounds like from, and I think I remember this from other stories that we did, that this is a pretty rough part of the the park. So uh, it would make sense if, you know, a single woman's walking around there maybe at night that um, 
unfortunately, you know, something could have happened, but uh, we don't know, obviously. So, yeah. Uh, so now let's fast forward to June 17th, 2020. This is a Wednesday. So the, uh, after a couple days of Erica not reporting back to her family, uh, they ended up contacting the authorities and reporting her missing. So we just to recap kind of the timeline. We've got her car being seen by park rangers on Monday and then her car was abandoned on Tuesday and now she was uh, reported missing on Wednesday. So that's a pretty clear timeline. We don't know who was driving her car, but that gives people hope that maybe she, you know, is still alive when she was reported missing because the first 72 hours of a missing person's case are vital. Yeah. Uh, no matter if it's in a, a national park or anywhere, but especially, especially in a national park where, you know, you've got a lot of, you know, external risks that you're dealing with and f- as far as animals exposure, things like that. So, um, moving on to June 20th, an individual, uh, named Martin Cox, who owns a home in the desert says he saw a woman matching Erica's description down to the tattoo on the inside of her right uh, wrist, sitting on the footpath near the Whitewater rest stop, which is about 45 minute drive from the 29 Palms area, uh, just outside of Joshua Tree. Uh, he goes on to say, it was kind of odd. She's just staring off toward the west. She didn't have a purse or any luggage. There was no one around, and she wasn't marked up. No bruises, no scratches. So Martin, you know, he sees this. He's like, okay, this is kind of odd. But he didn't really put two and two together until he uh, he got home and saw a missing persons flyer. And he he's like, he was quoted saying, that sold me. It was her. So now we have an eyewitness account of potentially Erica on June 20th, um, you know, 45 minutes away from essentially where her car was abandoned. So that is strange. And she seems it, it, his description of her just kind of staring off into nothing is odd. It almost gives you a sense of, you know, was she injured? Uh, You know, did she hit her head? Did she, was she, um, on some kind of medication that caused her to kind of zone out. It, it's odd. <laughs> yeah. So uh, moving on to, now this is kind of an estimation. Uh, unlike some of our other cases, I did not have a clear timeline of when the search and rescue operation started and ended. So uh, from a couple different articles I read, it sounds like the search and rescue mission started pretty shortly after she was declared missing and then kind of went through the next couple of weeks. So, um, you know, around the June 24th timeline, there would have been a large uh, search and rescue operation underway at this point. And according to the Morongo Basin Sheriff Station, they had search teams on the ground and in the air. And so they're searching the park and this lady has been sighted 45 minutes away from 29 Palms. Potentially, yes. And this is like her cars have been destroyed, graffiti, and she just like hitchhiked her way or something. Who knows? Yeah, It's starting to sound like maybe she did kind of snap a little bit. Yeah, we don't know. And, you know, based on our other cases, especially the Paul Miller case, we know what kind of search and rescue operation they mount in that area. I mean, it would have been massive. And they would have been using uh, helicopters and you know, that, that special technology we talked about in the, the earlier episodes where they... Yeah, the FLIR, the FLIR technology. FLIR technology and that photographing technology where they, they take thousands of pictures of the ground and then they have, yes. yeah, they have computers analyze those pictures to see if anything is unnatural. So like clothing or, you know, anything that wouldn't grow there. So massive search going on. And from what I gathered, the search between law enforcement, family and friends kind of carried on through the months of you know the summer into september october but so now we're moving on to uh june 27th and i made a note that this is an approximate date the article didn't specify the exact date when this was found but um someone had someone found her phone uh beside an interstate 10 off-ramp 
And the authorities who accessed the phone said there were no texts and that the phone had been completely cleared out. So somebody deleted everything on her phone and then ditched it, which is odd. <laughs> yeah, that starts that starts pointing towards foul play. Yeah. So, uh, like I said, that was June twenty seventh, approximately. I don't know. I it the article just said, I believe one or two weeks later. So. So now uh, things get a little interesting. So in my notes, I I Joe oh, I wrote this from July to September, and this is an estimated date range because again, I didn't have the the specific date that this started. But so the Lloyd family enlists a conservationist and cave researcher that goes by the name of Doug Billings to continue the search after the formal uh, search and rescue mission concluded. So Doug has uh, extensive exploration experience in Joshua Tree. And I can't believe I never heard of this case, but in 2014, he led to the recovery of the remains of uh, Aaron Corwin, a pregnant 19-year-old wife of a Marine murdered in a love triangle gone bad. So uh, it sounds, yeah, it sounds like a a horrific case, but he, uh, he, his exploration and, you know, cave diving led to the recovery of the remains. So uh, pretty interesting. Some of the articles I read said uh, Billings, systematically searched hundreds of abandoned cabins and other structures within a 78 square kilometer range of where Lloyd uh, disappeared. And Doug went on to say, I call it figuring out where she's not because of course I don't want to find her. I want to, I want to hear she's shown up in San Francisco on a hitchhiking trip. So yeah, that's i I've never heard of this before in our cases, someone hiring kind of a, you know, a bear grills type to go out there and, um, sure, you know, search, but it, it makes sense, uh, especially in an area that's got a lot of, you know, mine shafts and caves. So, uh, really interesting, um, thing that the family decided to do. And finally, then on September 5th of 2020, Doug Billings actually came back to the park and this time he was equipped with a drone and with one of her parents, Wayne, and they searched and they put up fresh banners and photos of Erica uh, and her car. So obviously, Joe, this is a pretty recent case. There isn't a lot of additional information at this point. There were some strange developments once Doug started <laughs> started uh, searching for Erica. So I, I'll, I'll read some, uh, some of these snippets I have down. And this kind yeah, of- it sounds like he's thorough enough that he's like, solving other cases yeah at the same time he's on cases yeah essentially that's kind of what happens so as doug is searching for erica in the high desert uh it led to a break in another missing persons case uh so it goes a family there was a family desperate to find their loved one um 56 year old james escalante who took off on a bike to help his girlfriend um who was stuck in the road in 29 palms and I believe uh, he was reported missing on September 7th. So uh, one of the quotes from his girlfriend uh, went straight up to Shelton, got to the intersection of Shelton and 62, called his girlfriend and said, I can't find you, can't find your friend. His girlfriend claims that she called the friend on three-way and asked her to honk her horn. She said she could hear the horn honking. James and I got it and hung up, Escalante added. Uh, so they're up there looking for a friend that's broken down. Uh, so he, he, uh, said, I got it, got in his bike. And that was the last time anyone heard from him. And it, from the news reports I read, it said no one's heard of him since June 25th. And, uh, oddly he was, uh, reported missing on September 7th. So there is kind of a lag there of when he was reported, but there's a twist in this case. So (laughs) more twists. Yes. So, you know, around the June, July, September time when Mr. Escalante went missing, uh, Doug is out in Joshua Tree searching for Erica. And while he was searching for her, he found a red bike out in the middle of nowhere. And detectives 
uh, go on to say that they also found two sets of human remains near the bike. And one set of the skeletal remains was found about a quarter mile south of uh, the Amby Road and Wilson Road. And I believe they said one of the remains was males. Uh, so this is strange. And the investigators also mentioned that they did find a cell phone nearby that they believe to be Escalante's. So I think it's it's safe to say that, and we don't have the DNA results back yet, that <clears throat> the remains of the the male that was found are probably Escalante's, but we don't know that for sure. Um, detectives, once again, don't suspect foul play here. They, they said now both, they, and they also think that both cases are not involved, um, and I'm not suggesting they are, and we'll get into our theories here in a second, but I just kind okay. of... I just find it interesting that, you know, Doug is out there in the wilderness searching for Erica and he just stumbles across this bike and sets of remains and a cell phone. And, you know, he's now, you know, solving another case, not that they have potentially, you know, intertwined, but it's just a, a strange twist in this case. It already is kind of strange. <laughs> Well, I think it's it's connected in a way where he's going to areas where she might be and they're finding other remains. So it either speaks to how dangerous those areas can be or if there is some sort of criminal activity going on in those areas where it's dangerous to be in. That's a good point. I didn't think of that, too. Um, like the one park ranger said, maybe there is a lot more criminal activity in this part of the park. So uh, we don't know. Before we do get into the theories, like I said, I was chatting with the mother of Erica briefly on Facebook before we went live here, and she er wants to urge anybody that's listening, uh, if you have any information on Erica, to call the We Tip hotline. It's 1-800-782-7463, and there's also a Facebook group out there, Bring I believe it's called Bring Erica Home. Uh, you can you can go and uh, join that page if you've got any information. Find out you know who to call. But so this is still an active case. It only happened a couple months ago. Uh, so Joe, moving on to theories. Okay. Uh, what do you think's going on here? <laughs> well, I think I mean how there's there's only a, a limited number of things that could have happened. Uh -huh. One. Um, she succumbed to the wilderness and yep. it was like on a, on a soul searching mission for herself okay. Two, there's some sort of foul play. She ran into the wrong people. She met up with the wrong people three. And I, I'm not saying this, I, I want to make it very clear. I'm not trying to be not empathetic towards this. I'm looking at this for just pure factual of what it could look like. Maybe she did get into drugs or other types of things to deal with what seemed to me like having some sort of a mental breakdown or I don't know if she went full to where she couldn't handle it and needed to get away, but was using things to medicate, you know, self medicate. Mm -hmm. um, or it's a combination of all those things. I being an optimist, I'd like to think that because she was spotted away from the park, that it is a combination of those things, but she is okay. Mm -hmm. I hope that she is out just traveling like, just, I mean, who hasn't gone through a really hard time in their life and thought about just hitting the reset switch? Like, move somewhere else, go somewhere else, start a new life, start yeah. over, and just shed all the BS. Not saying that that's good. You know, she has a kid, she has a family. But if she got into some sort of mental state and left, not saying that's good, bad, or indifferent, but I hope she is out there just getting her reset, hopefully comes to the realization that, you know, Although it can be difficult and there's a lot of people going through the difficult time, those difficult times typically come to an end and she'll return. Um, I, I'm going to hope that that's kind of the scenario. I hope that she's still out there and is hitchhiking around and working through her issues. Okay. That's, that's my theory. I'm sticking with that. I think she's alive and she is just working through her stuff and she just needs her time. And I hope that she comes back to her family. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's an interesting theory and i think based on the comments of some of her friends that you know said she kind of hit a breaking point you know this summer due to the the pandemic i think that's a, a possible theory i think first i'm going to rule out what i don't think happened 
Um, okay. I don't think it was an animal attack. Um, I agree. There's really not a lot of animals in that park that are going to be able to, you know, take down a, a full grown, you know, woman. I don't think that she died due to exposure only because I think she was going to camp. I don't think she planned on doing any kind of hiking. So unless she hit something with her car and was trying to hike somewhere, I don't think she probably died due to exposure. I think, you know, between Doug and the search and rescue, they, you know, I guess they didn't in the Paul Miller case, but you know, maybe they would have had a chance of finding her remains if it would have been exposure. I will say real quick, Mike, yeah. the car is the reason I think it's more potential of a self-medication thing. I look at that as she's drunk driving around and hitting random things and then just abandoned her car. Okay. I will. That, that was my theory. Yeah. I'm going to tie that in to um, maybe not. So my theory is, and I, I don't think it's suicide either. I think uh, she was a successful, you know, businesswoman, has a family, you know, she went through a tough time and kind of just needed, a, you know, a, you know, medi- meditate for a few days out in the woods. I th- Sure. So I, I think I'm going to rule out suicide. I, I'm going to go with foul play and I'll explain okay. my logic here. I imagine that she's drive. maybe she's driving to the park and it's late at night and she's tired and she hits this berm and her car is kind of busted up and maybe somebody pulls over to help her get the car to the campsite or maybe she drives the car to the campsite. She's kind of shook up and somebody there, you know, maybe tries to help her, but then things go sideways fast because like the park ranger said, um, it's a pretty brutal part of the park, a lot of drug use. And maybe she was abducted and may, you know, maybe they, they drugged her up. They got her car, ditched it out outside of the park on the highway. And then they started driving out of the park. And for some reason, maybe she got out of the car and she was kind of standing there dazed. Um, and I'm going out on a limb here. I have no evidence to sure. support this. I'm just trying to put together. Well, I think what's good about your theory is if my theory is correct and they feel that way, they're going to stop looking for her. Mm-hmm. And if your theory is correct, she needs help. Yeah. And she needs people to not stop looking for her. So it's almost like in the, in the in an air of caution, you'd almost go with the theory that could be the worst case scenario of she was abducted in some manner and is potentially under the influence against her will. Yeah. And is being brought somewhere um, for, for God knows what. And one of the theories I saw online and I, I don't know the family may have mentioned this was one of the ideas they thought was maybe she, she got into a car accident, hit something and she hit her head bad enough that she suffered memory loss. So maybe, it's a combination of memory loss and she got to the campsite, but there was some kind of unsavory people there that abducted her then, you know, and it would probably be even easier to do if you just suffered a massive head wound and you're confused and you you don't remember, you know, might not even remember your name if it was a bad enough head injury. Sure. So in, in I'm going with, is she was abductive? Is she's by herself injured? you know, around, you know, people doing drugs and other crimes. Like, I, I don't think it's too far fetched to say that she could have been abducted. Yeah. And you know, to, if, if I'm going to play devil's advocate on my own theory, yeah, I'm hinging a lot on the corroborated statement of a guy who claims to have seen her based on her tattoos. And it's I, my theory of 100% hinges on that guy being accurate, that that's yeah. actually her and not somebody else. So that is, probably not a big enough of a controllable statement like where you can be a hundred percent positive to really go down that road fully. Mm-hmm. So I think in this one, uh, what, what are the official theories? Do they have like officially stated theories from the authorities or the search teams? Um, so, you know, the authorities keep saying that they don't think foul play was involved in. Okay. Uh, yeah. You did mention that either of yeah, those cases. That. They really didn't give a specific cause of death. Uh, I, you know, they're probably just assuming, you know, exposure got lost, fell in the mine shaft, whatever. 
Um, you know, like I said, the family, family and other people online seem to think that maybe there's more going on here than what people are saying that potentially sure. foul play was involved or she injured her head bad enough in that car crash that she, you know, had memory loss and maybe confusion that led her to, uh, you know, maybe that led her to wander off into the wilderness where she succumbed to, um, you know, the elements. But I, I think foul play just partly too, because her car was in the park and then it was gone and then abandoned outside of the park. So, Okay, here, I'm going to play devil's advocate on that one. Okay. Remember when we came across an abandoned car in college that was blocking one of our parking spots and nobody would do anything about it? Uh Uh-huh. No, I don't. (laughs) You don't? (laughs) Are you just saying that? Because (laughs) remember, my my parking spot at our college house is blocked by that car that was completely abandoned. Correct, And nobody would do anything about it. Yep. And we were dumb college kids, so we kind of roughed it up a little bit to push it out into the alley so that it would come get towed because no one would tow it unless it was, they even said, we're not going to tow it unless it's blocking blah, blah, blah. So we made it do that. If that's a rough area and you have an abandoned car there, is it possible it gets stolen, beaten up by dumb kids? Uh, you know, I, I think after the fact, um, I think that's a, that's a possibility. I think, uh, yeah, it, there could have been, you know, people, maybe people were, drunk and just throwing stuff at it you who knows i that's think that's kind of what I'm, that's where I'm, I'm not saying you're wrong yeah i'm just saying i think there are potential possibilities for another reason why it was moved why it was vandalized things like that. it might be a separate event from her ditching it like maybe she crashed it it wasn't running she walked away yeah and but now there's a, a messed up car that's kind of messed up and you have some jerks come along and start spray painting it smashing all the windows Yeah, I don't know. It just it is odd that it was in the park on Monday during the day. Uh, Somebody moved it Monday night and then Tuesday they found it outside the park abandoned on the highway. Uh, So I think it just adds to the the mystery of this case. I think, like I said, I think foul play is my leading theory. I think something happened to her. Maybe she was abducted. I think another possible theory is she was in a crash and uh, suffered traumatic, you know, injury that caused her to be confused, and maybe she wandered off into the park without any kind of gear and succumbed to the elements. I mean, that's a possibility. Uh, you know, and like you said, Joe, maybe she ran away. We don't know her personally. I, her family would probably say, you know, otherwise, you know, they known her for a very long time. But we we have heard of cases of absolutely normal people just hitting a breaking point and they kind of snap and they do very, uh, they make decisions that aren't rational and yeah. that is a possibility. I don't, it's not my leading theory on this one, uh, but it, it's a possibility. And now it, it go way out there on a limb. Uh, a lot of crazy theories on Reddit. were talking about a serial killer in the area um just because it's a a theorized serial killer yeah no one knows okay yeah so you know maybe there's a serial killer in the park that um killed erica and uh got mr escalante and we still don't know for sure i mean there's a second set of remains that were found by that bike we don't know who's they they haven't identified they haven't identified i believe both sets of remains haven't been identified yet so we don't know that the other remains are Escalantes, but um, there were two sets of remains found. So, I mean, who knows? I think, <laughs> unfortunately, like all of our cases, we kind of end it with more questions than when we started. You know what I want to do? I might write an email to George Land, the PIO, yeah, from Joshua Tree that we we interviewed way after Paul Miller's case. I would I would love to un- get uh, his explanation of why they don't think it's foul play. Or, or just get his opinion on it. It would actually be great to try and get him to come on the show to do an interview again on. Yeah, let's this let's case. reach out to let's reach out to George and see if he'll be willing. It's George Land, right? That's his name. I believe so. Okay, um, that was a long time ago. Yeah, it was a f- um, few years ago. 
I know, right? Uh, yeah, it would be good to get him on just to even talk about, you know, again, if, if people haven't listened to older episodes, maybe kind of talk about the search and rescue efforts that they've been doing around this case specifically and then uh, what he's hearing from local law enforcement. So we should try and get him on. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that would be great. Um, so that is kind of the end of what I had for this case, Joe. Any uh, final thoughts? No. Um, as always, please share your opinions online. It's it's cool. We've been getting so many followers. We're over 16, followers on Facebook, 16,000 followers on Facebook, not 16. <laughs> uh, but with that, more people are starting to interact with the cases. I mean, that's how we found this case. Mm-hmm. And people are giving us their, either their, their private messaging us, their theories, or posting them online. Uh, and I love reading them all. We don't always respond right away, but yep. I do read them all uh, because there's a lot of interesting viewpoints there. But Outside of that, thanks again for tuning into our show. We appreciate all of our listeners for sharing the show with your friends and family as well. Uh, be sure to like us and follow us on Facebook. Interact with the the feeds, Instagram, Twitter as well. The YouTube channel has also been picking up. All the shows end up there also if you are someone who likes to listen to it on YouTube. So you can subscribe there and get notified when our video content goes out. And if you do want to support the show monetarily, you can always go on the Facebook store and buy some of our awesome, awesome swag. I just picked up my new winter (laughs) hat from Mike, and I'm going to be wearing it constantly because it's super comfy and warm, and it makes you look like a runway model, so it's great. (laughs) And uh, as Mike said in the beginning, we are releasing Patreon-only episodes. So when you sign up for Patreon, not only does it include swag at certain tiers, Uh, you will have exclusive access to content that is not on the broader podcast. And for a buck a month, it is not bad. That is not a dollar a day. It is a dollar a month. Yes. So, Mike, you're the accountant. What's that divided by 30? I don't know. (laughs) A few cents a day? Yeah, it's not a lot. It's not a lot. So if you can, great. If not, we will keep putting out shows. We're not going to go behind a paywall, so don't worry about that. Nope. Um, But just again, thank you very much. And always remember when enjoying the beauty of nature, whether backpacking, camping, or just taking a walk, always remember, leave no trace. Thanks, and we will see you next time.